we uh, are the Spanish speaking Association of the Americas, a regional chapter of the Acoustical Society of America, ASA. And this webinar is going to be presented in Spanish, but this time we're going to have simultaneous interpretation into English. So it's interested to an interesting way to start 2023. This is the first time we've done this. Um, okay, so today we have Dr. Fernando Solar Dorrego, and he is going to present on his PhD research on cultural acoustics. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about how about the ASA, how you can join the ASA itself and also the chapter. Here there are some links if you're interested in uh, becoming part of the board of directors or committee, you can um, write to us. There is always something to do. The events we hold don't have a lot of work to do by the committee, so good. Here's our board of our directors right now. We have our chair, who is Mariana Borotero, the vice chair, who is Felipe Raymond. I'm the treasurer, Zach, the Italian. I'm Secretary is Diego Suarez, Ana Jaravillo, and some members at large that you can see here. We are all um, greatly involved in uh, holding these events. So you can follow us on several different social networks here, or you could write to our email. Here, uh, this QR code, you can find all these links and also um, registration links for the events, previous recordings, etc., etc. Our next um, meeting is on March 30th, and that will be uh, Animal Bioacoustics by Laura Klepper. And if, if there are topics you would like to look at or if you'd like to contribute any specific topics, uh, write to us and we'll let you know. Um, as I mentioned before, this webinar has simultaneous interpretation into English. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you could choose the option to listen to it in English. And now I want to introduce Fernando El Solar Torrego. He's a friend of mine for a number of years now, and we've worked on this committee. He was the inaugural chair of the committee, so he's contributed a lot to this chapter. We're very fortunate to have a researcher, a consultant, with very great contributions to the industry as a whole and thank you Fernando and I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much Zach. Thank you very much for your introduction. I'm going to share my screen. So I think you can see a, see it there. Can you hear me properly? Yes. I'm sorry, I have. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, Fernando, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. 
So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the uh, research I've been doing uh, over the past five years. It was um, uh, PhD research uh, for graduate program at Acoustics Penn State University. I belonged to a research group called Sound Perception Room Acoustics Laboratory, and it's directed by my thesis director, uh, Dr. Michelle Vichon. This research group, we studied the interaction between uh, the perception of sound, the different uh, spaces where sound is generated. I want to make a clarification on what this presentation is going to be like. The presentation has, is based on three studies, three subjective studies, and the idea is the presentation is quite long, and I hope it's interesting. When each study ends, we will have a summary of the study, and if you have any questions that uh, during the presentation of that uh, study, I invite you to uh, stop um, uh, before we move to the next study, uh, and I'll answer questions for the from the Q and A. Um, so let's get started. Okay, acoustic is a science that's uh, located at the crossroads between other sciences. There's a book. Uh, written by uh, Frederick Hutt called Origins in Acoustics. Frederick Hutt was the thesis director for Leo Veronica at Harvard. And in that book, um, which is a history of acoustic uh, since the Greeks to the time of Newton, more or less, and he didn't move forward because uh, Frederick Hutt uh, died before he finished the book, but that um, book says that acoustic is a science that feeds off many sciences and the progress in acoustics, uh, a lot of times depends on progress made in other sciences, and theory of uh, signals and systems, uh, mechanics, um, and other sciences. Something very particular that happens in acoustics is that those of us, uh, those of us that uh, work in this, can be very interested in very complex mathematical derivations. But we could also be excited and moved by uh, the music that comes out of a good. Uh, performer or orchestra. So we also have a relationship with art. So we're not only scientists, we also have an artistic side. So the question is, can we design concert halls with um, acoustics that is uh, agreeable and pleasurable for the listeners? Does acoustic of a room affect the enjoyment of music? Can we create a room that has a certain size, certain geometries, certain materials? that will generate pleasure in the people who listen to concerts there, obviously with um, music that is properly played. That's an important part. But is there a link between these two things, between the geometry, the physical aspects of room, and the enjoyment that that brings to the people that listen to a concert in that concert hall? I once attended a concert at the Dallas Symphony Hall, which is a great... Um, Whole uh, here that was designed by Russell Johnson and the development committee of the hall uh, was given a lot of freedom so that the acoustic would um, sound well. There is um, has a, a couple of volumes. It has a series of tricks. And I attended a concert there, and they were playing uh, Mozart violin concerto, and the performer was Leonidas Kavakos, who's one of the best uh, violinists uh, currently. And that was the only time that I felt that besides the marvelous notes that came out of the Stradivarius uh, that Leonidas Kavakos was playing so well, uh, the notes uh, written by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, there was another layer uh, to the um, aesthetic enjoyment of what I was listening to. Um, and I go to concert halls, uh, uh, Colon Theater, but in that hall, I really felt something different. And there's a consultant who's a friend of mine in Argentina who gave me a definition of concert hall acoustics, which is um, the the a taste we get in the mouth when we have a good wine. Um, just that there are bad wines, there are bad uh, musicians, but that a nice aftertaste that uh, we have in our mouth after drinking could be the acoustic in the in the acoustic of the whole. Um, a friend and colleague told me that. So we have enough evidence 
to connect the perception and the emotion perception of acoustics and the emotions that they generate in people the the acoustics of of uh concert hall recent work by by um lab partner martin loss has said dr bichon uh proved that there was a connection between the emotions of pleasure when uh, um we uh eat chocolate that activates certain areas of the brain that are caused with pleasure and that happens similarly in uh the acoustic of a uh, concert hall they used an mri and they found that there were um places in the brain that uh, light up when the acoustics are are correct they had to put people in an mri machine and use headphones it was very complicated but they got these results so concert hall acoustics we're always moving between two worlds one world which is the physical world are dictated by the architecture of the hall the size the materials that it uses the ge geometry of the whole. And all of that creates a sound field, the, the sound, the direct sound that comes from the instrument, plus the reflections that are generated uh, from that sound within the whole, the uh, reflection patterns. So it creates a pattern of early reflections, which are imported from a perceptual point of view and a reverberation tail. That's the physical thing that um, happens in a concert hall. But when someone goes and listens to a concert in a concert hall, they can also um, describe it subjectively. They can say it sounded reverberate, loud, brilliant, uh, balanced. And these are all subjective um, concepts. So what we need to try to do is we need to try to bring together those two worlds and um create a whole architecture that will allow the people that are in that concert hall to have these subjective ideas um the room should sound clear or reverberant or loud or brilliant and we need to generate uh, to uh, create a physical room that will give rise to these um subjective perceptions in this there's something we call impulse uh, response which is the uh, response of the room to uh, the, the uh, response of the whole to that uh, DX Delta um, creates all the information out of the time of frequency debate, so the reflection of sound in the room. Um, it's a linear system. The um, wave equation is a linear equa equation, so with certain uh, limitations, we can assume that the whole is a uh, and one of these uh, sources are um, there's a dodecahedra that creates a source and it gives us an impulse response and a receptor position. We place a microphone and we measure the impulse response. If on the um, horizontal axis we have type and on the vertical uh, we have the amplitude to the then we have direct side, which is direct from the source to the receiver, early reflections that uh, bounce off two or three uh, surfaces that are very important from a perceptual point of view. And then the reverberation tail, which is the mul multiple uh, reflections that travel um, on uh, with greater frequency. It's though that in a whole, the um, density of reflections increase on the square of time and it generates a reverberation tail. These are the uh, reverberations that come from many different uh, directions and they attenuate more and more because they travel a longer distance and they interact with a larger number of surfaces um, that are removed intensity. So from the impulse response, we can derive acoustic parameters. It has been found that these um, parameters are um, related to subjective aspects of, it, uh, of uh, Hall's acoustics. These acoustic parameters summarize information contained in the RI. These are related to uh, several subjective aspects of uh, the acoustics of a whole. The most accepted parameters uh, can be found in Addix A of uh, standard ISO standard 3382-1. This um, defines how to measure reverberation times, but it has an Addix that lists a series of parameters that um, uh, derive from the um, impulse response. There's a strength, which is the uh, amount of passive um, amplification generated by the 
um, Hall, Reverend Briggs, Clarity, Source with literary development. Uh, there's, uh, it describes these parameters that are associated with the subjective aspects of a room's acoustics. So, the objective of this research, of my doctoral, um, of my PhD research, was to obtain more information on the uh, currently accepted acoustic parameters. The uh, motivation arose from a paper in 2011 of John Bradley. John Bradley is a well known scientist and consultant, uh, acoustical consultant. He's Canadian. He worked us for several years on the uh, National Research Council of Canada, and I took them for several years. I asked him to give me some recommendations, including he suggested that I um, publish my uh, paper in Acoustical Society of Paper and not another general but in a paper of uh, 2011. John Bradley stated that the acoustical parameters that we have is not that we have to send, is throw them into the garbage, is that they're informative and they, they are useful, but we need more information about those parameters to be able to complete all the uh, range of knowledge that we could have uh, regarding these more accepted parameters. So what do we need? Let's see. We need to um, understand the uh, small di differences. What are the just notable differences? What... So you could have the uh, perceptual. Um, so there's a uh, change in the perception associated with that parameter, which is the minimum difference that we have to introduce the parameter so that there's a perceptual difference. And those are the just notable differences that we need to know how we need to change the different octave bands of the different acoustical parameters to find these uh, single uh, number frequency averaging that are associated with that parameter. And finally, we need to know what are the preferred values that have more information about preferred variables so that we can go to a concert hall and uh, is, whether it's symphony music or chamber music, what are the preferred values for those parameters to be able to design a room of this type. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of this presentation. As an introduction, which I already mentioned, then I'm going to talk about study one, which is how to obtain a just notable difference uh, for a parameter, an acoustical parameter called early decay time or EDT. Then study two was find the single value frequency average measures, which are summaries or simplification of the octave band for the different parameters that best correlate to the subjective aspects. And these single value frequency average measures were found for EDT, uh, the clarity index. And study three, which is a study which is still ongoing, we are still uh, testing subjects, was to find the preferred values for acoustical parameters. The results of uh, study three are not conclusive because we are still are testing subjects because the we don't have a sufficiently large sample side at the end of study what i'm going to try to answer different uh, questions that arise and then we can move on to study number two study one as i mentioned was uh try to find a just notable distance for the early decay time but to give a little bit of context about the study and let's try to understand what these just notable differences are. It's a concept deriving from psychophysics. Psychophysics is a science. The pioneers were Weber and, and what was the name of the other guy? Um, Weber and no, I can't remember what the name of the other German scientist was who began this science. And what this science does is that it finds uh, the relationship between parameters in the physical world, for example, the temperature of a wall or of a um, uh, routed how people uh, perceive those uh, differences with their own senses. So the just notable difference is the minimum change that has to be introduced into an objective parameter that will create a change in the associated uh, subjective aspect uh, so, for example, I have a uh, apple in my hand that weighs 200 grams. If I um, 
compare it with one that um, weighs 205 grams, the idea is to see whether a person can um, tell the difference. This is a statistical measurement and it's the minimum change that we introduce into a physical magnitude, uh, such as the weight of an apple that can create a change in the perception of the a person. So we have the real weight of an apple and how a person perceives the weight of that apple. So knowledge of the JDs of acoustic parameters is crucial during the design phase of a room because it allows us to know if a small change in the architecture, for example, the orientation of a reflector or a change in a material will have an impact that can be perceived by the people that uh, listen to a concert in that hall. If I were to change the position in a uh, reflector to increase the um, clarity index, if that change isn't above that J and D, people will not perceive that. So it will make no sense to make that change. So this is a room that's under conduction, uh, construction. And um, if I'm going to make a decision to change the uh, geometry of a room, I need to know whether people are going to be able to notice that change. If I have a model, um, we have different geometry, um, but that the changes always have to make a change that is above that J and D. Historically, in um, the science, in the, the uh, science of room acoustics began at the end of the 19th century, and uh, scientists found the relationship between um, a physical parameter of a room, uh, which is early decay time, and the perception of reverberance of a room. So for many times, the reverberance size was the only parameter that exists to uh, predict reverberance. But in more modern studies, it was found that there was a parameter called early decay time that has to do with the um, early decay curve that is uh, better related to uh, reverberance than the reverberation time. So was, um, EDT was pr originally proposed by V. Jordan in 1970, and it's determined as a time uh, for decay of the first 10 decibels in the decay curve. That is then multiplied by six so that it can be uh, comparable to uh, reverberation time. So if in a room I uh, generate um, uh, a constant uh, sound level and then I cut it off at a certain time, going to, the sound is absorbed by the surfaces and it has a decay curve that looks like the blue curve that can be seen here on the chart on the horizontal axis, we have time in seconds, and on the vertical axis, we have the decibel drop from zero decibels, which is where the uh, sound was cut off. So uh, early decay time is associated with the uh, decay of the first 10 decibels that is multiplied by six, so it can be uh, comparable to reverberation time. So it's the time that sound needs to fall off 10 decibels. To obtain that, there are two times. One is interpolating by uh, Interpolating straight tie by minimum squares. You see that? That's one time. It can be interpolated with that straight line. And we can see how long it takes to decay 10 decibels. And then there's another method that is proposed by David Riesinger, which is the time uh, between uh, the cutoff of the emission time and the decay of uh, 10 decibels. And that's the early decay time. EDT is better correlated to the perception of reverberance than the uh, reverberation time. And the reverberation time is a perception of the persistence of sound in the room when the instruments uh, stop uh, emitting sound. And this makes a lot of sense that the perception of reverberance in a concert hall is associated with the beginning of decay. When we are listening to a concert in a concert hall, we are always uh, listen to the uh, beginning of the uh, decay time because the music continues and it doesn't allow us to hear the uh, the reverberance. So the only uh, piece of music that allows us to um, hear those two seconds is the uh, Corollarius Overture by um, Beethoven that has a stop chord and the entire um, orchestra stops playing and there's a long enough pause in the music 
that allows us to hear the entire decay of the sound uh, for the time that the reverberance lasts. There are studies, uh, subjective studies, that found that EDT is better correlated to the uh, perception of reverberance. There is a study by Lehman in 76 who used binaural heads and uh, live orchestra recordings and they uh, averaged uh, frequencies between 100 and 3,200 3, hertz of the early decay time and the correlation that they found Okay, I seem to have lost his um, audio completely. Fernando, nos escuchas? Okay, he's back. Sí, ya, volviste. Gracias. Okay, wait. From Lehman. When you were just explaining early decay time was related to the true perception of reverberance. You heard about the corollaries overture? Okay, so. There are studies, subjective studies. We have Lehman from 1976 that used a binaural head and a live orchestra to obtain a impulse response and used an average, an averaging scheme of 100 hertz and 3,200 hertz. And he found the correlation between reverberance and EDT was very high of 0.89. And Barrett in his classic studies of British uh, holes, where he said expert uh, listeners with questionnaires for an average scheme of octave bands of 125 hertz to 2000 hertz. And he found that the correlation between EDT and reverberance was 0 0.53, while the correlation between um, reverberance and uh, that's described as T30 many times was 0 0.39, so much lower. Uh, the correlation between uh, reverberance and reverberation type, uh, the, the correlation between um, EDT and reverberance. There were um, earlier studies to find the JD between reverberance type, and there was a famous study by Seraphim in 1958, as Seraphim used um, noise signals with decay and he would change the slope, the, the ratio, the um, decay speed. So he'd ask people if they could determine a change in the decay slope that was associated with the type of reverberation. Uh, uh, quicker decay uh, slope uh, had a shorter reverberance. He uh, measured over 500 subjects. I have no idea how he uh, measured. Uh, measured 500 people, I tested 21 and I almost died. Um, and he used um, noise signals with decay filtered by octopus. And the usually reported value for the study is that they just noted that there is approximately 5% of the reverberation time. What does this mean? If I have a room that has a reverberation time of two seconds, the just noticeable difference would be um, 0 0.1 seconds. So if at that, in that room that we has a reverberation time of two uh, seconds, if we put it up to two comma one seconds, then uh, a person can um, notice a difference in the uh, reverberation time. Uh, this is a study that was published in the book by Kramer and Mueller, and this is a very important um, book because it summarizes all the research that was done in the 60s and 70s in Germany. It was a lot, these were all papers that were in German and uh, Kramer and Mueller's book um, summarized a lot of that research that was done in Germany. And then an employee of uh, called Ted Schultz translated it into English and um, thanks to him, I was able to access those papers because I don't speak German. So 
On the um, horizontal axis, we have the reverberation time in seconds and on the vertical, we have the just noticeable, noticeable difference as a percentage of the reverberation time. So this is the value that is generally reported from this study, which is 5%, 5% of the reverberation time but for reverberation times that we usually find in a concert hall which is around two seconds the just noticeable difference is actually 3.5 percent of the reverberation time according to the study i don't know uh one way or another this is the value that has always been re reported it's always reported that it was five percent and this is what is quoted in Annex A of the ISO standard 3382-1. Um, we can see the per perceived reverberance, the acoustic one is early decay time, and the just noticeable difference is relative 5%. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the experimental design we use to find this new just notable difference of the early decay time. There are different methods to find a just notable difference. There is the um, uh, adjustment, there is the um, limits, and then there's the uh, constant stimuli. And we use that method, which is more precise, and using a variable called two alternative force choice, which is uh, offering two alternatives that they have to choose one or the other. So. Uh, what people, the, what subjects this was they compared a standard stimulus that did not change um, over the test with a comparison stimulus that varied over a range of EDT values. So we had an impulse response that was a standard impulse response and a comparison um, re impulse response. And these were convolved with anechoic music uh, to generate music. So. We had a standard impulse response and another uh, comparison impulse response, which we modified the decay, the early decay time artificially over range of values. So subjects had to compare a standard stimulus against the comparison stimulus. The comparison stimulus was always more reverberant than the standard stimulus because it always had a longer early decay time than the standard stimulus. The uh, work of the subjects was to correctly identify that the um, comparison stimulus was more reverberant of the two, but the uh, subjects did not know which was the uh, standard stimulus and the comparison stimulus. So they had this graphical interface. Uh, they could uh, listen in an anechoic chamber. They could hear both fragments of music. What was the standard? What was the other uh, comparison? They did know which one it was it could be play a play b uh, then they had to select which of the two sounded more reverberant subjects the response the impulse response um were convolved with uh by a fragment of anechoic music uh which was uh, george Bisset, uh fragment a 20 second fragment and then with the uh, experimental fragments we adjusted a psychometric curve which is what the constant stimuli uh, method um, proposed. And from that, we found the just notable difference. So a psychometric function was adjusted to the experimental data and the J and T were obtained from that psychometric curve. So this uh, graph we have here on the right, the horizontal axis is the percentage of change of early decay time of each of the comparison stimuli. Each of the uh, red dots, um, one uh, stimulus had 5%, um, another had 50%, another had a change of 25%, another had a change of 35%, et etc. et cetera, up to 90% uh, change in the early decay time. And then the probability that the standard stimulus um, was more reverberant than the comparison stimulus is given for each value of the comparison stimulus um, is given by the number of answers um, where the sub where the subjects uh, correctly identify the comparison stimulus as more reverberant um, uh, over the number of ties. So uh, 
uh, the probability was 0.6 percent with this uh 50 percent uh change in edt um it was 0.8 percent 0.8 so eight percent and so on so then with the software that's special for this that uses a bayesian um statistics we adjusted this um psychometric curve that uses this formula we use this bayesian um adjustment there are certain uh, adjustment uh, parameters that are adjusted by the software where c is the value of the comparison series in edt how it the percentage of change in EDT varies uh, in the comparison stimulus. A is the um, threshold, the J and D, and B is the uh, slope of the psychometric curve. So the constant stimulus method says that, that we adjust the psychometric um, curve. We have to get to 70% of the adjusted psychometric curve and that gives us the just notable difference so the just noticeable difference of the ad is 25 percent what does this mean that so that a person statistically can detect a change in reverberance we have to change uh edt by 25 percent if we have an edt so that people can someone can um um, notice a change in reverberance, we have to increase or decrease it by 25%. So, as I said, we had a series of um, impulse uh, three impulse responses for different three different holes, and we used three different um, impulse responses. We found uh, a JD for each of these impulse responses, and each of these impulse responses was uh, corresponded to a different. Um, because it holds. The first one is a uh, uh, shoebox shape, which is a very uh, common shape for a uh, concert hall. We call it shoebox modern. It has 2005 seats, uh, median frequency T30 of 2.9 seconds, and on average, it's minus 3.5 decibels. So in the chart we have on the right, we have on the horizontal axis, we have the octave bad frequencies. And on the vertical axis, we have the early decay time in seconds. And the early decay time spectrum is what we can see in green there for whole A. It has more reverberates in the low frequencies. Then room B is a shoebox classical, which is. 25 the third one is a fan shape it's not very good because it doesn't have many um lateral uh reflections it has a uh, number of seats uh, is between 1,900 and 2,100 seats. The reverberance time is between 1.7 to 1.9 seconds. And the clarity is between uh, zero and one decibels. And it's a much less reverberant room and it has the spectrum of early decay time. And the experimental design for that study, what we did was we had four cases where we modified simultaneously all the octave bad uh, frequencies. We modified the EDT in all of the, um, if we modified the EDT for all the octave bads. And then we were interested in the just notable difference when it mod was modified more than, uh, on more than a certain uh, part of the frequency, uh, low frequencies, middle frequencies, or high frequencies. I was receiving some comments that maybe if you can do pauses or talk a little bit slower so that it, the interpretation can be easier. No, no, it's Spanish. 
the way you're presenting, but a little bit slower. Okay, yes. Okay, thank you. So the experimental design was uh, four basic cases, broadband cases, where we modified the um, our EDT on all the um, pads simultaneously and three cases of individual pads, where we uh, modified a certain uh, range of frequencies. So we had a total of seven cases. We had the cases that we called all bands, where we modified all the bands um, simultaneously, uh, their early decay type. We modified the bands between 63 and 8,000 hertz, and we used all the holes, holes A, B, and C, um, and we made changes in all of these uh, changes. The uh, percentual changes in the EDT were 5, 15, 25, 35, 45, 60, 75, and 90 percent. Those changes were made in the EDT of those values um, of the comparison stimulus. Then we use a pooled case, which is a case where we converge the uh, data of all the beds of uh, the three holes. They were the results of the three holes were combined also in all the octave bands and the perceptual changes were the same. Then we analyzed um, individual uh, bands, but only for room A with um, impulse responses for uh, hole A. And so this was the low bed. We um, modified uh, for 63, 125 and 250 hertz. And for the low beds, we discovered that to detect a change in river bridge when we only modify the uh, low uh, beds of the EDT, it's very difficult to detect a change in reverberates where we modify the low bands of the EDT. So because of that, uh, percentual changes in the low bands are much larger. They go up, move up to 120%. Um, in mid beds, which are uh, frequencies um, between 500 and 1000 Hertz, we only made changes in uh, hole A and we moved to percentual uh, central changes of five to 90 uh, percent. And then we modified the high beds, um, 2000, 4,000 and 8,000 Hertz. And I want to tell you the spectral changes of the EDT of the signals um, that were a uh, percentual type here. I have the case of room C where we changed all the beds simultaneously. So the base case is the red case, and we increased um, in all the um, octave beds, we increased our uh, ADT uh, percentages that can be seen here, 5%, 50%, 25, 35, 45, and so on. And what I want to show you is the perceptual changes in the high bands uh, when only the uh, high bands were changed in the case uh, seven, room A, the base case is the red line, and these were the percentual changes in this case, in case uh, seven, where only the high bands were modified. The oralizations of, of these uh, stimuli were uh, performed in the Auras Hall in, on the Penn State um, campus, and we used uh, a uh, third order ambisonic system. This is the Auras uh, room, which is an anechoic chamber, which has a spherical um, loudspeaker array around the listening point. The anechoic uh, behave, uh, chamber uh, behaves as a free field up to 200 Hertz. Uh, uh, below that, we start to get modal probes and it's no longer anechoic. Uh, in uh, one third octave bands. So there's a spherical ar arrangement around the listener. It has 30 speakers and two subs. And the physical sound field, the measured physical sound fields, because these impulse responses were measured in consult, concert halls. We uh, uh, carried out uh, 
measurement um, program in 21 different concert halls. And we used the Eigen bike, which is a third order Southfield microphone that allows um, codifying the uh, sound field of the concert hall in third order ambisonics. So we can reproduce very uh, precisely within um, the Aorus rooms. So in uh, using a tablet um, that my colleague Max O'Neill is using in the center of the room, you can, with one button, you can um, listen to the music as though you were in the concert hall in Amsterdam or in the uh, Boston concert hall. So um, you can press a button and uh, hear the changes of the music. The reproduced uh, sound field um, reproduces on a sweet spot um, in the Aorus room, which is about the size of a human head. So the results of the J and D of the early decay time, the results we obtained with 21 subjects, that was the sample size, showed that the J and D, the wideband J and D uh, for the ADT is much higher than Seraphim's value. And the reasons that we th believe why this happens is because Seraphim used interrupted um, interrupted uh, noise as a signal. We used uh, music that was being performed and it's much more difficult. It's much more easier, sorry, to find uh, to find changes in reverberates in, in cutoff noise with decay than in music that is being performed. It's much more difficult to notice those uh, changes. So the JND of the uh, uh, EDT that we measured is much uh, higher than uh, what Seraphim found. It's much more precise because what we listen to at a concert hall is music, not noise with decay. So in a hall, the JND we found was 80% for room A, for room B, it was 13%, and for room C, it was 25%. This is always for broadband changes that modify all the uh, bands, uh, the, all the bands of the EDT simultaneously. And then finally, we uh, pooled all the results. And uh, this is the value that we can quote from our work, that the J just notable difference for EDT and broadband is 80% uh, um, change in early decay time. Now we also have uh, an assumption that is it's possible that the JD of the ADT is a constant number in seconds more than a percentage of the ADT. What we observed is that we multiplied the EDT of the middle frequencies by the JD of each room. The um, number in seconds, in seconds of time we found was similar for all three rooms. The three rooms have a very different JD. What is 25%? What is 13%? But if we have the spectrum of the three rooms, spectrum of the EDT for all three rooms, where the black uh, spectrum is for hole A, the uh, green is for hole B, and the purple is for hole C. If we take the middle frequencies of the EDT of room A and we average them and we multiply them by the J and D we found, we get that that multiplication is 0.44 seconds. If we do the same for room B, we average the uh, the ADT um, times the JD of that room, we get 0.33 seconds. And finally, if we take the middle frequencies for this room, for room three, and we multiply it by its JD, we get a volume of 0.36 seconds. This um, suggests that uh, maybe JD is a constant number in seconds in, a range of between 0.3 and 0.45 seconds, but this is just a, a, a possibility that we have found. Now, when we just modify certain bands of uh, ADT, 
the JND is much higher than the than the broadband JND. It's much more difficult to detect a a reverberant a change of reverberance when we modify individual bands of the EDT than when we modify all the bands. In the case of low bands, that change has to be very large. We found that JND is 92%. For mid-bands, there's more sensitivity. Um, the ear is more sensitive to reverberance chains uh, when only the mid-bands of the ADT chains, uh, we get a JND of 45%, whereas for high bands, uh, JND was 56%. So some takeaways uh, of these results, from these results is that low frequency changes in EDT are not very effective to create changes in perceived reverberance. A trick that sometimes is used in a room to decrease uh, EDT without modifying the T30 is to add uh, absorption close to the stage. That reduces the um, early reflections it reduces EDT without uh, modifying the reverberation time much, but this absorption that we see at the front of the concert hall doesn't need to be broadband because changes in um, the EDT low frequencies have a very little impact on perceived reverberance. So just by uh, absorbing uh, medium and high frequencies, we can uh, introduce a change in perceived reverberance. So this is a summary. Uh, I'm going to give you a summary of study one. Uh, JDT of uh, broadband EDT is approximately 80% of EDT. Um, JDTs for individual bands are much higher than broadbands. Uh, that for broadband, uh, EDT changes at uh, low frequencies are not effective for inducing reverb changes in perceived reverberance. Um, it may be that um, the JND for broadband EDT could be a fixed value between 0.3 and 0.45 seconds. So if we uh, modify um, the EDT in 0.45 seconds, we were find a um, uh, change in perceived reverberance, and this study was um, published in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, as proposed by John Bradley. I'm going to do, take a pause now, and I'm going to answer questions. Um, do you want to read the two second? I can answer them. So at that time, I can't see any questions in the chat, in the Q&A. So if you like, you can move on. But if anyone has questions, OK, there we have one. You want to read it? Alexis Campos says, are the beds separated by octaves or by third, third octaves? No, it was octave band. They were separated by octave bands. And, and it's very rare when you show a chart of an acoustical parameter. It's very rare to have it in a third octaves. In, in room acoustics, it's common to show a parameter spectrum in octave bands, not in third octaves, or at least that's how I've seen it always. There's another question here from uh, Manuel Castizo. What is the meaning of a JD of 80% of EDT in the spatial dispersion of a room? Yes. Yes, that's what it says. In the um, spatial perception and listener envelopment and apparent source width, the spatial no, I can't understand the. Maybe if Manuel can clarify the question a little bit more. Maybe what we'll say is the variation, uh, uh, the effect of the early decay time on the room. Uh, how 
the different positions change. Uh, so yes, it's a good question. Uh, many times the variation and the ADT around the room, if it's lower than the just notable difference, there would be no uh, changes in perceived, perceived uh, perception in different seats around the uh, room. Is this correct? Okay. Thank you, Fernando. Any others? No. One just came in. Could the, it be an objective that the TR and EDT values are the same? If you can... Yeah, they can be similar. What I think is that in a concert hall where you listen to music, EDT is more important because it's better correlated uh, to our perceived um, reverberates than reverberation time. Se diseña el volumen en metros cúbicos que tiene, se diseña con el tiempo de reverberación. También se, hay un, hay este, una... Um, there's... In a room, there's an objective in the reverberation time, but what uh, actually tells us um, our perceived, the, the reverberates we will perceive is more EDT than reverberation time. Anything else? No. No, no, no. Okay, so we can move on. Okay. Let's move on with um, study two, which are these famous single value frequency average measures, which are the averages of different octobands of a parameter that best correlate to um, the associated subjective aspect. So these single value frequency average measures should uh, best correlated to the associated um, a perceptual attributes. So for practical applications of uh, room acoustics, so it's able to reduce uh, octobad values to a single SVBA measure, and that SVBA should be best correlated to the associated perceptual attributes. So for example, if we have early decay time and we separate it into octobands, what we want to do is we want to um, have a weighted average of those um, early decay times and those, and but I need to know what are those coefficients of the weighted average. I've talked a lot about early decay time, but now I'm going to talk about another parameter called the clarity index. It's associated to the perception of musical clarity. Musical clarity is defined, uh, I got this uh, definition for the group of Marshall Long, is the degree with which individual sounds, the rapidly occurring individual sounds can be distinguished. Uh, clarity, is, good clarity is desirable in a concert hall and musical clarity in uh, the book of Carbel Bure, they uh, so the it, musical clarity is correlated to a clar this clarity index. How is the clarity index defined? It's a quotient of two magnitudes and decibels. So the numerator of what set of parentheses there is the energy that is uh, during the um, early part of the impulse response uh, from zero to 80. Uh, milliseconds and the denominator is uh, between 80 milliseconds and all the way to the end of the impulse response. If you integrate all of that, there will be values of energy, it, uh, find the value in decibels, and what the uh, clarity tells us is that if the clarity is negative in decibel, we, it means we have more energy in the reverberating tail than in the additional part. If it's positive, we have more energy in the early part of the impulse response. And a high level of it, the clarity index is associated to good clarity. Reverberance and clarity are uh, opposing um, values. More clarity means less reverberance and vice versa. Recommendations in the literature to When I studied the state of the art of this, to be able to uh, obtain S SVFA measures, they're based on the practical experience of acoustic consultants. 
the case of EDT and reverberance time, what they usually do is they average the octave bands uh, of 500 or 1000 hertz. So um, if we're looking for EDT and RT, we average those uh, octave bands. There's a common practice, but there's a lack of evidence that these averages represent changes of reverberance in, in broadband. If I, if I average the entire uh, frequency spectrum, I want to know whether these two um, bands um, are representative of the entire uh, frequency band. So the person study to was to obtain as many measures that are best correlated to their associated perceptual attributes. As I said, there's a, not much evidence that the average of octave bands of 500 hertz to 1000 hertz for ET is a good predictor of reverberance. This procedure is described in the book of Braddock concert halls and opera houses, and in the ISO standard 3382-1, and there's no unified criteria to average the different octave bands to predict musical clarity. Braddock proposed a measure called Clarity Index 3, where he averages the uh, octave bands of 500 hertz, 1000 and 2000 hertz, and uh, he justifies that the uh, temporal um, discrimination of the human ear, the temporary discrimination of human um, ear below 500 hertz is, is very low. So um, that's why he justifies using these octave bands. Um, and the ISO standard proposed this averaging octave bands of 500 hertz and 1000 hertz. So I'll tell you a little bit about the experimental design of my second study. And this study is made up of three parts, parts A, B, and C. Part A uh, was to um, obtain these um, weighted averages, the SVFA measures for these two parameters, EDT and clarity index, that best correlate to their subjective aspects. Part B was to validate these SVFA measures to see if they could predict clarity values that would then occur in practice. And part C was a correlation analysis for values of reverberance and clarity that we did. And we correlated uh, different octave bands to see if there was a relationship between different octave bands and and uh, the octave bands uh, for clarity index and decay type um, to the perceived values of clarity and reverberates. So what we did was we adjusted a multiple regression um, formula to predict reverberates and perceive clarity. So the independent variables of these regression models are um, octobad pairs for EDT or clarity index. So uh, this is a regression model that talks about um, reverberance. There are four independent variables, which are uh, pairs of octave bands on um, bands for each clay type, 63, 105 hertz, 250, 500 hertz, 22, and there's a term which is a constant term. For the clarity index, um, independent variables are octave band pairs for the clarity index. And the dependent variable, what these models predict is the predictive reverberance or clarity value. And it predicts on a scale of zero to 100. So zero would be zero reverberance and 100 would be enormous reverberance. So to obtain the data to feed into this regression model so that it will generate the coefficients of the regression model, the subjects um, value stimuli with changes that only occurred in a pair of um, octave bands at the same time. These stimuli were created via a computational modification um, the impulse responses were taken and um, the EDT and the clarity index were um, modified 
per uh, octave, uh, octave band pair um, related to a base case. So these are the nine stimuli that for early decay time that people listen to. There were nine stimuli in total, always related. The, the changes are always related to a base case. Stimuli one is a stimuli where in the um, octave band pairs, no changes were made. And if there were no cases, um, no changes compared to the base case. So it was basically the base case again. And so the subjects were um, presented this, uh, they were asked to judge reverberates on a scale of zero to 100. Simuli two is a case where um, ADT was increased by 90% on the uh, octave pairs 63 to 125. The other octave pairs were not modified and subjects were asked to evaluate the reverberance on a scale from zero to 100. Similar three, um, the octave band pair from 60, 63 at 105 hertz were um, reduced 90%. The other uh, stimuli have uh, less changes in reverberance because remember that for EDT in larger, uh, in higher uh, octave pairs, um, the just noticeable difference is lower than in lower frequencies. The same thing happened with a clarity index. Similar one is a stimulus where there were no changes in clarity and subjects were asked to judge how much clarity that stimulus had. The same thing happened for stimulus two. Uh, the clarity was increased by eight decibels. The other bands were not touched and so on and so forth. To calculate the results, the people to enter the results, people the subjects use this graphical interest, the all nine stimuli were there, and they could play. Not, sorry, they could judge clarity um, and reverberates in this case from um, values from zero to one hundred. They would listen to stimulus A. They didn't know which stimulus it was. They listen just listen to the music and they. Um, rated reverberance from zero to 100 and how much they um, believed it was reverberance and then they listened to stimulus B and compared it, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to show you some of the results that we got from the regression model we used. So the regression models we obtained for study two, part A, with a sample of 24 subjects for reverberance, we found this regression metal. Here we have the coefficients uh, that are already uh, replaced in the formula. They're replaced in the linear regression model. And what we see is that the highest octave bands of the EDT have the greatest importance uh, to for predicting reverberance. In a linear regression model, the coefficient associated with an independent variable tells us how important that independent variable is to predict the dependent variable. For clarity, um, we also found that the high frequencies are the most important predictors of clarity. The um, octave base pair of four to eight kilohertz are the most important for predicting clarity. So we said that study two had parts A, B, and C, and part B, we tried to validate these regression models um, to see if they were actually predicting clarity and reverberance. And for that, seven stimuli from seven different rooms were chosen, and we asked the subjects to uh, rate those seven stimuli uh, in terms of verbs and clarity scale from zero to 100. So the models um, obtained in part A and the octave band values for EDT and C80 
for these uh, seven holes were substituted into those regression models. And those regression models um, gave us predictions for reverberance and clarity for those seven holes. And then we compared uh, predicted values against the independently rated values uh, for those seven um, holes. So we, and these are the results. This is for reverberance. On the horizontal axis, we have the independent um, valuations. The horizontal axis shows us the, the uh, values assigned by the um, subjects on a scale of zero to 100. Um, for the different holes and on the vertical axis, we have the predicted values of reverberance. Um, values close to the diagonal indicate good predictions. If we're close to the diagonal, it means that there's a good uh, correlation between the prediction and the measured value. For clarity, it's the same as the same uh, chart. The vo if values are close to the diagonal, um, it's good. good. Hole G is a bit of an outlier. The prediction wasn't that good there, but in general, the regression formula uh, was able to predict um, the reverberance and clarity values very well. And part C, with those seven holes that had been um, rated uh, on reverberance and clarity, the octave bands for those um, uh, holes were um, also correlated to reverberance and clarity values. So what we did was, was correlated the different uh, octobads for EDT and CA80 for those rooms with their uh, reverberance and clarity values uh, correlation um, shows the linear match uh, between uh, the values Correlation doesn't imply causality because I could also say that when plants grow, uh, increase this will rain because uh, plants could also grow because I gave them more nutrition, not just because it rained more. So, what was the idea of this? That I have an additional check of the regression values. So, these are the correlations that were found between the different um, pairs of octobads for EDT um, and the reverberance values. What we found is that uh, medium and high uh, frequencies of EDT have a high correlation with perceived reverberance. And curiously, um, Beranek's recommendation of averaging 500 and 1000 Hertz showed the highest correlation with reverberance with a correlation of 0 0.637. For clarity, it was found that there's a very high correlation between the highest uh, frequencies of the clarity index and clarity. It's a very new result. And we're very happy because it gives us an idea that the um, highest uh, frequency in the uh, clarity index have the greatest impact on perceived clarity in uh, in a concert hall. However, uh, Beranek's recommendation C83 doesn't show a very high correlation with clarity, only a correlation of 0 0.53. I'm going to summarize study number two. We generated two regression models to predict reverberance and clarity based on the values of octobeds of EDT and C80. So I give these two regression models the values of uh, octobad values for EDT and C80, and they can predict uh, reverberance value. The values predicted by the regression models were similar. Um, they were quite close to the diagonal line. For those obtained from the subjective evaluation of reverberance and clarity, the average of uh, mid frequencies for ADT showed the highest correlation to perceive reverberance, and the highest frequencies of C80, 4 kilohertz and 8 kilohertz, 
showed the highest correlation with perception of clarity. So we're going to have another pause here and answer some questions if you have any. Zach, do you want to read and um, the? We have one question, but it's for the previous part. And it came in after you'd already started the second part. That's the value, the JD value of 5% um, that's proposed by the ISO standard. Is that very demanding then? Yes, for me it is. For me, it's very hard to detect a change in reverberance that's not higher than 18, 20%. 5%, I remember that, especially when we're listening to music. I remember when uh, they did the um, renewal of the acoustic hall of Teatro Colón. Um, they showed that they had, the engineers showed that they had that matched precisely what was historically taken as a JD for EDT. But for me, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get to that level. It has to be a much larger change to be able to have a change in reverberance. Very interesting, Fernando. And These studies are very interesting. What I think is very interesting that um, reverberance at 500 uh, kilohertz to 1000 uh, hertz uh, really correlate to Branick's principles, and that on the contrary, uh, clarity. Um, measurements were not so, uh, were not in such agreement. So I thought that was very interesting and hopefully that will help us design better. Okay, I have one last study and then with that we would finish. If there's no more questions, I don't see any other questions, so let's continue. Study three, is to find these preferred values for acoustic parameters. I'm going to give you a little bit of context for study three about preferred values for acoustical parameters. When an acoustic consultant is going to design a concert hall, they need to define certain goals in their design for the room. First of all, they're going to decide to the, uh, to the, as regards the number of seats it's going to have but they can also aim at a certain uh, reverberation time. If it's symphonic music, it'll be above two uh, seconds, but if it's chamber music, it, the relationship, the ratio will be lower. So they define certain acoustic goals when designing their room. And these goals are translated into preferred values for acoustical parameters. Um, values we can aim for when we want to get a positive good result for the type of room we have, the type of hall we have, or the type of music that's going to be played in those halls. So we need to have uh, ADT, uh, clarity index, strength, which is the um, room's passive amplification, uh, the uh, specialty parameters, and so on. So most of the preferred values of acoustic parameters uh, we have today are based on the practical experience of acoustic um, consultants. Branick proposed several preferred values. This is in his book, the scat of his books. And he says that for a uh, symphonic repertoire with over 1,400 seats, uh, RT and when full should be between 1.8 and 2.1. Uh, and seconds is an average 0 0.5 to 1 kilohertz, uh, 2 to 2.6 for ADT. Here we have the clarity index 3, um, with average uh, 5 uh, 
how to do a thousand words and uh, has recommended values, um, symphonic uh, chamber, etc. A study of British Halls Baron also proposed preferred values for acoustic parameters, and the ISO 3382.1 standard um, also proposes preferred values, which can be found here in the last column. What is is there are not many recommendations of preferred values of acoustic parameters for different types of music. There is a very interesting study by Wallace Class uh, Sabine, who, who was a uh, father of architectural acoustics, who also at the start of the carried out studies at the beginning of the 20th century, the New England Conservatory of Music, where in one of the rooms of the conservatory, there was a, a pianist playing music. And there was a series of listeners in the room. And uh, so it was at um, cushions and blankets to reduce the reverberance of the room. And he asked listeners um, what, uh, how much reverberance was uh, was the their preference for the music they were listening. Then there were two other interesting studies from the the start of the 1920s, 1930s. There are uh, studies done by uh, McNair and Lipschitz, and they related the optimum uh, reverberation time for different types of music uh, as a relationship uh, to the volume in cubic meters of the room. And the premise that these uh, researchers had, because what they found was that the optimum reverberation time uh, grows when the um, volume and cubic meters of the room grows. And they uh, found that the intensity of the reverberant field of the a room must remain constant as the volume of the room size. So, so these discoveries by Lucia McNair, they have, we have these, these charts. I took these uh, from the Book of Martial Law. So we have the optimum uh, reverberation time, which is on the um, vertical axis increases depending on the volume of the room. So we have recording studios, we have the volume in cubic feet, and then the the um, reverberation time in seconds for recording studio, for auditoriums, for a uh, house of worship, opera houses, and so on. But as the volume of the room increases, the reverberation, the recommended re reverberation time also increases. There are very few studies of preferred volumes of acoustic parameters that have been formed since then. The same going too quickly. So I'm going to explain a little bit about the experimental design of this study that tried to find preferred values for different acoustical parameters. So the idea of this study was to take a group of very different concert halls and create a ranking of um, acoustical preference, uh, depending on the type of music, um, have a ranking of these halls, uh, depending on the type of music they were preferred uh, for uh, in terms of acoustic preference. I prefer this acoustic over and above this other type of acoustic. So the preferred halls, the um, acoustic values of those preferred halls are the preferred values for this type of music, because if a hall was preferred for that type of music, then that means that that hall has the values that we want to have, the acoustic parameters we desire to have for that type of music. Preferred values were obtained for different styles of music. We used music from Baroque period, period by Handel, uh, cla music from Classism, a piece by Mozart, and music by my favorite romantic composer, uh, Felix Mendelssohn. So in the sub um Room Acoustics Laboratory, um, Matthew Neal created uh, 21 concert halls, by so last week array measurement 
I participated in the measurement about 10 or 11 uh, holes, I don't remember, but it created a we created a database of rooms to be able to access impulse responses in all these holes, for all these holes. So to identify similar concert holes, we use the method k-means, uh, cluster analysis methods, and these um, methods are very popular because of data, data mining. Um, and so this method works as follows. We have selection variables, which in this case were uh, mid frequencies for EDT, the rooms, uh, clarity at X3 because no, uh, although I uh, it, I said it wasn't very well correlated to clarity. I still use it as a selection variable and the number of seats in the room. And these were three coordinated axes where each point is a room. The uh, values of the frequency, uh, mid frequencies of EDT, uh, clarity is a number of seats. One point is a room. So what this the K beads does is that it group in a three-dimensional space, it groups all the rooms that are similar. So here what we have, because the three dimensions is difficult to draw, we have um, coordinate x of two um, selection variables. Um, in the first way, we have early decay type for the different and mid frequency for the different rooms, and we have clarity at x3 and decibels. All the points that have the same geometrical figure belong to the same cluster, to the same group. Here in this other graph, we have on the horizontal axis, the decay type at mid frequency, and on the vertical, we have number of seats. And on the last one, we have clarity index against number of seats. So everything that has the same um, geometrical figure belongs to the same cluster. They don't have to necessarily have to have the same number of members and then um, from each cluster, we choose one which is representative, which has, which are the ones that are colored. So from each cluster, we take the most representative one, and those are the rooms that we use to um, carry out our preference ranking. One thing that we could have done is we could have taken those seven holes and put them in an interface where it, with each of the stimuli and have the people for each, have people rank them depending on each type of music. Say this one has a preferential value of 90, this one has a preference of 45, 35, this one's 70. But that type of um, valuation, which is called direct scaling, is not uh, suggested when we're trying to evaluate preference. So we're trying to evaluate preference we should use effective uh, studies where people uh, integrate their um, all their perceptions so that they can uh, offer a general perspective, a general appreciation of uh, a product. It could be marmalade, it could be toast, it could be whatever you like. So they should use all their senses to evaluate how much they prefer a product or a concert hall in our case. So. For this type of evaluations, we uh, don't suggest using direct scaling. We um, suggest using uh, different methods, including paired comparisons. So for each style of music, um, subjects will listen to uh, pairs of rooms. And then they would select which of the two rooms they preferred. Do I prefer this one or do I prefer this one? And they um, also uh, evaluated how much they preferred the selected room than the other one. So they had this interface. They could listen to both stimuli of the two rooms they were uh, comparing. And then they would say, I prefer room uh, a B over room A. And then with this slider, they could say, I, B and A are both equally preferred up to 10 when B is extremely more preferred than A. When you do uh, all the comparisons, it's a lot of comparisons because you have to compare all the holes. This calls us something that's called the Barry scores. 
which are uh, preference evaluations for every whole out of um, range from zero to one. For each uh, whole and for each type of music, this uh, the sample that of the results I'm going to show here had only 18 subjects, so there's not many subjects. So the results we have are not conclusive, but I want to show you these results. So for Baroque, for music, Baroque music, uh, the seven holes that are down here, these are the preferential values. These are box plots, which are a way to chart, which show the standard deviation. We can see that room F is uh, most preferred for Baroque, but there's not a lot of clarity. You can't really see which is the most preferred room and which is for I mean, from the classical period. There's even less um, difference between the means and for the romantic period, there are different groups. These two, these two and these three, which are uh, down below. Apparently room F and room E are the most preferred ones. This is the summary of the uh, preferred values for each room. So you could say, well, if for Baroque, the um, preferred values should be extracted from Hall F for classical music, from Hall F and for romantic period from room F. So here there will be a problem because the th room F was um, uh, most chosen for all the rooms because, but um, that's to be expected because it's a very small sample. But the problem is that we can't use the information used here because in statistics, we aren't so interested in what happens in a sample, but what we're more interested in what happens to the population because we just have a sample of 18 people who took the test. But what we want to do is we want to infer what's happening in the population um, of all the potential subjects that could have taken this test. So to rank the uh, concentrators, we use a technique that's called analysis of variance, ANOVA. And what the analysis of variance uh, proposes a null hypothesis where the means of uh, preference of all the holes uh, throughout the population, um, all the means are exactly the same. There's an alternative um, hypothesis that at least one mean is different from the others. So to determine this, if we could reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, we use something that's called the F test, the Fisher test, which um, calculates a statistic F, which is basically a division between the mean squared, um, between the means with, over the um, mean squared error within the means. So this gives us this distribution, which is the Fisher distribution. And based on a critical uh, F, by for F, which is the, the probability that I incorrectly rejected the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative I, hypothesis, that error has to be very small. In scientific um, research, that a value has been a greater 0, 0,05 probability. So if F star is greater than F critical, uh, if the calculated F of the sample is greater than critical F that we reject H um, with a reject the um, H zero in favor of alternative H with a probability of zero point zero five. So we have to um, fulfill the assumptions of parametric text that the, uh, there's a normal distribution of the data, that there is homozygoticity, that there's independence of errors, and that there are no outliers. So if these assumptions are fulfilled, then we use a parametric one-way ANOVA. And then the only thing that ANOVA lets us know is if there's a difference, at least one difference between the means. So with these uh, post hoc uh, 
tests, I can see what how many differences there are between the means. If they aren't complied with, then use a Friedman uh, non-paramagic ANOVA. I'm going to show you the results. So these are results that we're going to see now. You're going to see the uh, rooms that um, have average preferences that are statistically equivalent. This rooms that belong to the same group have uh, means of preference that are statistically the same. So all the uh, rooms in group one have statistically the same um, Pref uh, means of preference and in group two, these means here are statistically uh, equal uh, between the two. So there are significant difference only between uh, rooms B, G, D, E and F because rooms H and C are in both groups. For classical music, there is only significant differences between uh, hall B and hall E and hall E. And for romantic music, we created three groups. So there are significant differences between uh, room uh, hall G and hall C and hall E, F and hall H, D and B, and between E and F and hall H for romantic music. What we can see is that hall F is always uh, most preferred for the three types of music. I hope that as we uh, start testing more people, then we will um, find out more. But whole F was most preferred for all types of music. So what we did was we calculated the values of the acoustical parameter for these seven holes. So of the most preferred holes, the most preferred holes would have the most preferred um, acoustic parameters for these types of music. So um the values of the most preferred holes are the preferred values so what parameters did we calculate using the results that we obtained in study two what i calculated for these seven holes were the uh, single value frequency average measures uh, that we obtained for study two for reverberance and clarity of these holes we evaluated those that regression formula using the uh, octave bands for EDT and clarity indexes for these um, seven holes, and we uh, got the SVFA measures for these seven holes that are ranked in terms of preference. We also obtained the strength of the the value for strength, early lateral energy fraction, which is associated with the the perception of the width of the source and the uh, strength of late lateral reflectance, which is related to listener envelopment. So now we can see the results for the SVFA of reverberance with um, sub of 18 uh, subjects. We have the three types of music. So on the horizontal axis, this is the volume obtained, the single volume, frequency average measures for reverberance for each of these rooms. We um, evaluated the regression model using the EDT for each of these rooms. The rooms that have the same color belong to the same group, and there was a red below to group one and group two. So the preference of the vertical axis, what we can see is that hall F, as is the most preferred one, determines that the preferred value for Baroque music for this acoustical parameter, this single bar frequency average is 40. It's from 0 to 100. For classical music, it was also uh, 40 because hall F was the most preferred one. And for romantic music, it was also 40. So there's not a lot of information here. And for the three types of music, the um, preferred value for S, the SVFA measure for reverberance is 44 or the scale to, to 100. So I could design a room using this regression formula aiming at a value of 44. The SVFA of clarity for Baroque and classical and romantic music 
So it's whole F is always the most preferred one. The values are the same for the three types of music, which is around 60. SVFA for clar uh, clarity is around 60. If I wanted to build a good concert hall, I should aim for a value of 60 in this SVFA. And then for strength, also because Hall F and Hall E are preferred, these are between uh, seven and eight decibels. These are the preferred values for this parameter. And early lateral energy fraction, uh, the preferred value is around 0 0.6. Strength of late lateral reflexes for the three types of music is uh, at around one decibel. That's the preferred volume we found. So I'm going to summarize it very quickly. Thank you for sticking around until this time. Thank you very much for your patience. So uh, we established a preferential ranking for seven concert halls for three styles of music. One hall, hall F, uh, was most preferred for all styles of music. The preferred values obtained in study three are within the ranges uh, proposed by Beranik, the values in Beranik's book and the ISO standard. And the results are uh, strictly preliminary because of the small size of the sample. We need to uh, test at least 26 or 28 subjects. Okay, I'm going to stop here to see if there's any more questions. And then I have three slides which are kind of uh, conclusions and future work. Thank you very much. I don't know it's a lot of time, um, but thank you for staying. Yes, we have two, but they're very similar. So what requirements the subjects need to have? Do they need to know about music? Are they musicians or is there no uh, no knowledge of of these things? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, no, we in Sprouse Lab, we're very demanding about that because there are studies that prove that musicians can detect smaller changes in a stimulus they um, understand that much, they understand much more quickly, and we require that they have at least five uh, years of formal training on, on instruments and that they also practice on instruments in a band or with a professor. So we need people that have good musical knowledge. Yes, right. Okay, thank you. So let's move on. Conclusions. So I'm a person who's always very influenced by the ideas of theoretical physics. I love uh, physics, especially theoretical physics. So when I began my research five years ago, I decided that I would have a great idea and I was going to come up with a um, formula like this. And then after a lot of mathematical development was that I was going to come up with a um, an equation like this. But what I found is that in these subjective studies, there's a lot of variation in the results. A colleague that I have who I respect greatly, I respect his ideas, and I learned a lot from him, who's Matthew Deal. I remember that he did a subjective study where he asked people to rate different types of acoustics in terms of their clarity, their reverberance, warmth, and other perceptual by sort of scale of zero to 100. And the data he obtained, the standard deviation of the data was 20 points. So there's a variation uh, around the mean of 20 points up and down of uh, what uh, uh, reverberates or clarity measures to be for a whole. So subjective uh, studies have a lot of intrinsic variability. We use statistics. Um, we try to find uh, results that are uh, most correct statistically. We have this result, but it has this potential error. So in this study, these three studies, we studied several parameters of um, parameters of concert hall acoustics we study. We found a new value for the JD of EDT. The most important frequencies 
um, pads for ETS C80 for perception of reverse and clarity were identified. We obtained eight preferred values for acoustic parameters. This is still work in progress. And in the future, we would need to continue collecting data for study number three, uh, reach uh, 2628, identify why um, room F or hall F was preferred for all musical styles in study three and write um, two more publications on studies two and three, which is what we're doing right now. Here, there's a list of references and I'm going to stop sharing. And I thank all of you um, for over an hour and a half. If there are any questions, then I can answer this one again. Okay, thank you very much, Fernando. Uh, right now, I don't think we can answer any more questions because we're uh, at, we're we've gone long, but we're going to publish the video on YouTube and on our network. So maybe you can um, go to the comments and can, do you want me to put up my email? Do you want me to put put up my email if you want to contact me? Yeah, please put it in the chat and. We can, you can write, they can write to you. I uh, have to uh, just send it to Mariano Botero. I have to send it to everyone. I don't see how I can send it to everyone, but okay. I'll do it. Just a sec. Okay. Well, thank you very much, to everyone. Thank you for attending today. The talk was very interesting. Uh, we thank you very much, Fernando, for taking the time to do this. And congratulations for your great work. And it was a very important contribution to this research. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye.